Thank you very much, Ibrahim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen. Was salatu was salam ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala Ali wa Sahbi Ajmain. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to be here with you today to discuss a very, very important topic that is impacting financial markets today, and that is to focus on transforming Malaysia's economy and society through Islamic finance. And we are very privileged to have Tan Sri Abdul Wahid Umar, the chairman of Bursa Malaysia, here with us today to talk about some of the mega trends that are impacting the Islamic markets in general, Malaysia in particular, and what role Islamic finance or Sharia compliant investing can play in addressing some of these issues. This event comes at a very pertinent time because we see the mega trends that have slowly been emerging over the last few years significantly accelerate over the last two years during the pandemic and have now become major forces affecting Islamic markets. Earlier this year, Refinitiv launched a report in collaboration with ICD, the Islamic Corporation for the Development of the Private Sector, looking at mega trends that are impacting Islamic markets and looking at the role Islamic finance can play in taking advantage of the opportunities that these mega trends create. Six mega trends were identified as being quite significant and they broadly fall into two categories, either technological or societal with overlap between each. They cover the increasing digitization of all digital, of all business channels, operating processes, business activities, and so on, and the impact digitization is having on businesses in general. They cover the emergence of artificial intelligence, whether that is machine learning, whether that is the use of data and analytics, or any other thing, which is significantly transforming the way information is collected, utilized, and mobilized by institutions to better serve their societies. And finally, on the technological side, the last one is the emergence of disruptive technologies that are transforming uh, markets and how these disruptive technologies will play a role in business environments going forward. On the social side, we also have three emerging mega trends. One is the increasing inequality that we are seeing in Islamic markets. That becomes a significant challenge and one that needs to be tackled and addressed. We see the emergence of youth. You know, we've been talking for many decades about the young population that exists in Islamic markets. Well, today that young population has now moved from in the educational sphere towards the career sphere. They are working in the job market. They are building wealth. They are making significant consumer decisions. And how does a society move to cater to their needs and effectively utilize the skill sets and the capabilities that they bring? And, you know, when we talk about demographics, uh, you know, we always focus on the young demographic, but one that is often overlooked is the aging population that we have today. And increasingly, you know, through the advent of better health care and better services you know people are living longer people are healthier for prolonged periods of time so we have aging populations that in itself creates opportunities for markets if they are able to take advantage of them so these are some of the mega trends that exist and islamic finance and related aspects like sharia compliant investing and others play a unique a unique role in being able to take advantage of these opportunities through its intrinsic nature of being aligned with real economic activity through its principles of inclusivity and through the various tools that are available, whether that is the uh, social finance tools that exist within Islamic finance, whether that is the entrepreneurial nature of certain financing instruments, whether that is the you know, risk sharing nature of certain financing instruments. A lot of tools are available within Islamic finance that can help to not only um, you know, address some of the issues that arise from these megatrends, but to utilize many of the opportunities. And in this session today, we're going to focus on the Malaysian experience and on the opportunities that exist here. And we are very, very grateful to have Tan Sri Abdul Wahid Umar with us today to share his insights. Tan Sri, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. My first question, Tansri, and you know, when we talk about megatrends, you know, people are often, you know, focus on the challenges, but I always like to start on a positive note. And, you know, we've discussed there are many positives that exist out of this. So I think, you know, to start with, if you could highlight some of the unique opportunities 
that these megatrends can bring to different Islamic markets, particularly markets like Malaysia, uh, to, to, to get the conversation started. Well, thank you, Mustafa. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very uh, good afternoon. Thanks, uh, Rasmus Mokta and distinguished um, speakers, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you uh, for having me uh, on this session and thank you uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon. I must say it's a bit uh, awkward in the sense that uh, normally uh, you have uh, both uh, in the same place uh, or uh, <laughs> perhaps the moderator uh, being um, physical and the speaker being uh, on the other side. Uh, but uh, today it's unique in the sense that uh, we have you, Mustafa, as the moderator uh, some, somewhere in California, I'm told. Um, meaning that it's actually very late uh, in the evening. Um, uh, now, if I may perhaps um, just give a, a quick overview of, of where we are today before I answer your question. Now, uh, for me personally, uh, I must say that we in Malaysia, uh, we have done really well uh, when it comes to the development of the Islamic finance and the Islamic capital market. Uh, now, you've heard uh, that Omar uh, Adon said uh, talking about uh, how we have progressed uh, in terms of these summit capital markets, uh, where we have uh, doubled in size uh, from 1.1 trillion ringgit uh, back in 2010 uh, to about 2.3 uh, trillion ringgit um, where we are today. Uh, and considering that's actually done within a decade, that's actually uh, tremendous. And we find that uh, about uh, two thirds of um, uh, the capital markets uh, would comprise of uh, Islamic capital market. And this is very much consistent uh, with the progress that we have uh, in Islamic banking itself. Now, uh, I think it's actually very important for us to understand how did that come about? Uh, and I think uh, it is actually a combination of uh, a myriad of factors. Uh, number one, obviously, we have um, uh, the clear uh, vision uh, from our forefathers about wanting to develop uh, Islamic capital market running parallel uh, to the conventional system. And that's actually supported by very pragmatic um, legal framework and, um, and follow through uh, with appropriate uh, execution by the, by the various institutions uh, and uh, effect effectively uh, supervised and regulated uh, by the Central Bank and the Securities Commission. Um, and I would say that the way we have approached the market is actually one that's actually very pragmatic in the sense that uh, if you go back to the uh, purpose, uh, then you're talking about um, uh, providing uh, that uh, financing and capital market uh, products uh, to the masses uh, based on needs. And one of the things that had um, fueled uh, the success is actually the, what we call the Islamic First strategy uh, being adopted by the Islamic banks and the Islamic financial institutions, uh, whereby it's not about uh, providing um, the China compliant product per se, but it's about uh, providing uh, people the access to financing, uh, but in a Sharia compliant manner. So in many ways, uh, very much inspired by the concept of supermarket. So when you go to uh, Tesco supermarket, for example, in Malaysia, um, everything is actually uh, halal, except for the small uh, conventional uh, or, or the, the non-halal section. Um, um, Whereas um, you know, in the past, if you were to walk into any um, financial institution branch, um, everything would be conventional with a small um, halal window. Uh, but we have since uh, turned that around, inverted it, uh, such that you walk to any financial institutions uh, here in Malaysia, uh, you will automatically be served with uh, shared compliant products. Um, but if um, you still require the commercial product, you have uh, that. Um, uh, conventional uh, window, uh, if like. So it's very much inverted. So with that um, approach, uh, that's why we've seen uh, the tremendous growth, both in terms of uh, Islamic banking and Islamic capital market. Now, um, on our part here at Brusa Malaysia, we, uh, we have seen um, the, the promotion of uh, Islamic, Islamic capital market uh, in a big way, uh, such that today uh, we have uh, some 700, 765 uh, Shah compliant securities, so made up of 752 uh, Shah compliant securities, uh, stocks rather, uh, four Islamic REITs, uh, six uh, Islamic uh, exchange traded funds, and uh, three uh, Sukuk listings. Um, and of course, we provide that the Bursa Malaysia I platform uh, that's um, enabling um, 
um, straight through processing uh, from uh, trade and settlement uh, for uh, Islamic French institutions. Uh, and of course, also the Bursa Souk uh, Al Sila, uh, which is um, our commodity uh, Murabaha uh, platform uh, that's actually uh, necessary to provide that liquidity uh, in the uh, Islamic um, uh, market, uh, if I may. Now, um, aside from securities market, uh, our Sukuk uh, market uh, stood at 1.1 uh, trillion ringgit as of 2021, and that represents 37% uh, of uh, our global outstanding uh, Sukuk size of uh, $711 billion, or about 3 uh, trillion uh, ringgit. Now, uh, the Sukuk uh, market represents about 63%. Uh, of the total bonds and Sukuk outstanding of 1.74 trillion uh, ringgit um, in Malaysia, and which mirrors the proportion of the uh, Mission Islamic Capital Market. Now, given um, our leading position as an Islamic Capital Market, uh, there are certainly many opportunities that the Malaysia can catalyze uh, from the global mega trends uh, in the Islamic world. Now, perhaps I can uh, focus on three of them. Uh, firstly, on digitalization and uh, artificial intelligence. Um, uh, to begin, um, I would like to acknowledge how uh, digitalization and artificial intelligence are transforming uh, the way uh, the world operates. Uh, these uh, new economy themes uh, shall focus on innovation uh, and disrupting uh, incumbent thinking on how uh, businesses uh, operate. Now, Malaysia embraces uh, digitalization and uh, we do encourage innovation. Um, in fact, uh, if you look at um, the, the recent um, Global Islamic Fintech Index, um, Malaysia is ranked uh, number one uh, among 64 OIC and non-OIC countries. And uh, the GIFT Index um, represents uh, countries that are most conducive uh, to the growth of Islamic Fintech market and ecosystem uh, in their uh, jurisdiction. Uh, secondly, on aging, uh, which uh, Mustafa, you uh, mentioned uh, a bit earlier on, um, one of the major challenges um, happening here in Malaysia, uh, and as well as many other countries too, uh, is in respect of the aging population. Uh, now, uh, in Malaysia, uh, I think uh, early on it was mentioned that the um, Malaysia would be an aging society uh, by 2044, uh, but there are some of the studies that suggested that that will happen even much earlier, uh, whereby by 2035, 15%. Uh, uh, 15 percent, uh, one five percent of um, Malaysian population uh, will be uh, of the age of uh, 65. Um, so uh, naturally, uh, with that, uh, there's um, huge potential for uh, Islamic pension funds. Um, currently, uh, in terms of the private uh, Islamic pension fund, uh, it's actually less than uh, 400 million dollars, uh, and that's actually uh, hardly two percent of the. Um, you know, two hundred billion dollars uh, that we have uh, under uh, EPF. So clearly, uh, there's a lot of um, you know, prospects for that. Um, secondly, on uh, inequality, um, now we believe that uh, Malaysia has uh, potential uh, to be regarded as a global model for excellence uh, in uh, Islamic finance, um, and this is because uh, Islamic social finance instruments play a vital role in reducing poverty. Uh, and addressing the challenging socioeconomic problems uh, such as education, uh, unemployment, uh, malnutrition, and health issues. Uh, and over the years, um, we've also seen these instruments uh, being developed uh, to reduce the gap uh, in uh, inequality. Now, um, if I may perhaps continue, uh, Mustafa, um, uh, to talk about uh, what are the uh, challenges. Uh, well, uh, on the flip side, um, the key challenges um, uh, for the development of digitalization and AI uh, that we need to address, uh, that will include uh, the societal concerns uh, in respect of uh, data privacy. Uh, and this has arisen uh, very much from uh, a number of uh, cases of uh, data leaks. Um, so obviously, uh, that's actually one concern. Uh, the other concern is in respect of um, whether automation and AI uh, would disrupt um, and take away jobs. And thus, it will impact uh, the people's uh, livelihoods. Um, in respect of uh, aging population, um, uh, poverty at the old age uh, is one that has to be uh, addressed. Um, and I think Dato Omar mentioned that uh, in his uh, opening remarks. 
uh, to suggest that the, um, the EPF data uh, shows that the current retirement savings for most missions uh, are barely enough uh, for a decent life after retirement uh, and where more than two-thirds of EPF members uh, at the age of 54 um, have less than 50,000 ringgit uh, in their uh, savings. Uh, so that's obviously uh, would be uh, insufficient. And on the issue of inequality, uh, one key challenge um, is um, in respect of the uh, utilization of philanthropic Islamic social finance instruments uh, such as uh, zakat uh, and wakaf. Um, and uh, mobilization of uh, the funds uh, could be restricted due to, due to the uh, regulatory hurdles. Um, and typically, uh, when it comes to Malaysia, uh, many of these things are actually under the jurisdiction of the states. Um, so for this reason, we have uh, seen some Islamic uh, financial institutions uh, collaborating with uh, the respective Islamic religious councils uh, of the various states uh, to deploy uh, zakat and wakaf uh, as part of their financial products uh, and uh, transactions. Um, I I'll be happy to actually cover uh, that a bit more uh, later. Thank no, you, definitely, uh, Tansri. I think you, you've articulated it very, very well. And I would like to drill into each of the uh, points that you mentioned one by one. And uh, if we could start with digitalization and artificial intelligence. I mean, you rightly said that, you know, Malaysia has been a leader in this. It's recognized as, you know, arguably the most developed uh, market for Islamic fintech, definitely one of the most developed markets for Islamic finance. But you highlighted very, very significant challenges, challenges related to data privacy, which is, you know, a very real issue that we see continue to uh, play on the minds of financial institutions all over the world. You mentioned with the advent of artificial intelligence, the impact on jobs. And, you know, uh, you know, research shows that, you know, 50% of jobs today will become obsolete in the next five to 10 years. Uh, so that creates significant pressure on job seekers. So from your perspective, as, as one of the leaders of the investing community of the Islamic finance industry for Sharia compliant investing, what does the industry need to focus on to tackle some of these challenges while still taking advantage of the opportunities that artificial intelligence, digitization, and some of these emerging technologies create? Well, uh, thank you, Mustafa. I think you always have to go back to purpose, right? So I think at the end of the day, uh, when we talk about um, digitalization and artificial intelligence. It's about uh, creating a better society, a more well-informed society, um, and um, also uh, enabling um, you know, using those technologies uh, to be able to access uh, the whole community, uh, and in particular, the underserved uh, community. And uh, if you just take the example of um, uh, the, the impetus for issuing uh, digital uh, banking licenses, for example. Uh, and that's very much driven mm -hmm. by the need uh, to uh, provide uh, access to the underserved community. And um, I think within the context of Malaysia, uh, that's been the, the, the very basis of uh, the central bank's approach, uh, where um, you know, the, the five um, you know, licensees um, well, to be issued uh, would be uh, for them to be able to actually meet this unserved uh, market, the IFAMI. And, and that will include uh, the two uh, Islamic-based uh, uh, digital uh, banking uh, consortium. Uh, I think there's one led by Kaf Investment Bank and, and the other one, um, Aeon uh, Financial Services uh, Company Limited. Um, so uh, I think in that respect, uh, we have um, Rafiza here from uh, Kaf uh, who can speak about that uh, in more detail later, I suppose. Uh, but going back to uh, true intent and purpose, uh, naturally, whenever you want to do something good, uh, there, was, there will always be uh, those uh, unintended uh, consequences. Uh, and I think it's actually for us to be aware of what those things are and come up with a clear mitigation, uh, how do we address that? Mm. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, maybe two things. Number one, when it comes to jobs, um, I think if you look at it realistically, um, AI um, will... Um, allow us to do away with uh, all the mundane uh, routine stuff. And uh, with the advantage of uh, AI, we will have better decision making. And uh, therefore, the human capital um, required will be focused on those areas where we can value add a lot more. And if you think about it uh, further, within the context of Malaysia, 
uh, where we have significant migrant workers, right? So over time, if we can align our policy stride, uh, we will end up with um, higher uh, jobs uh, or more jobs um, that actually uh, that are being higher. Uh, and this uh, will relate back um, later to um, the future well-being of the society uh, as well. Uh, in respect of, um, uh, again, some of the unintended consequences about um, the, the market, uh, if I may, uh, in trying to address um, equity, um, we often spoke about um, how do you uh, provide that um, underprivileged community with access to financing uh, at affordable prices. Uh, so before this, uh, at lunch, we had a conversation where typically uh, the, the privileged community would have access to financing at better pricing uh, compared to mm -hmm. the underprivileged community uh, where they have access to limited financing uh, and at the rate of financing which they have to pay uh, is typically higher. So the challenge would be how can we ensure that as we move um, towards digitalization, uh, that the, um, uh, I suppose a mismatch uh, is able to be addressed. So perhaps uh, moving away from what we call the risk-based pricing, uh, where you price higher for the credit risk that you uh, take um, mm. from the borrowers, um, to perhaps a more purpose-based uh, pricing as well. Um, so I think that's a, perhaps a conversation uh, for. Uh, for the digital players uh, and for the rest yes. of the community as well. No, I, I, I think definitely. And, and that is something that has to be addressed to tackle the inequities. Otherwise, they will continue to grow. But as, as you rightly mentioned, with the advent of the digital banks in particular, you know, there's a lot of expectation on increasing inclusivity and social uh, equitability when it comes to access to finance going forward. Um, before we move from the topic of digitization, just one thing, Tansri. Uh, something you mentioned really resonated with me, and that was that, you know, when Islamic finance was launched in Malaysia, it shifted away from being an Islamic finance for all to customize solutions catering to the needs of the users, right, across the board, across the spectrum. Today, what we see is consumer needs and consumer preferences are changing, and they're changing very, very fast. So how can the Islamic finance industry continue to cater to these evolving needs? I mean... You know, people predict that, you know, we go from, you know, a bank would go from four customer segments to eight customer segments to 15. And eventually, you know, it will be a customer segment per customer uh, because everyone's preference would be different. So how can we leverage technology to really uh, address these changing consumer preferences? Well, um, I'm from the baby boomer generation, uh, Mustafa. Uh, so perhaps uh, uh, a, a bit, um, obviously, uh, each for that. But anyway, um, I think obviously uh, as we move forward uh, with uh, big data uh, and AI, uh, you will have the ability to really um, focus on the very detail of every single transaction um, in the marketplace. And uh, from that, uh, you then be able to uh, figure out uh, the, the preferences of the consumers and uh, down to the very uh, detailed um, you know, person, right? Uh, and therefore, mm. uh, whatever you offer will therefore be able to be more targeted. Uh, but having said that, um, I always like to go back to purpose because I don't really uh, people exist um, in this world, uh, so they have their basic you know world needs, um, and uh, within that context, um, you know they need um, a home, um, and therefore they need the financing uh, for uh, their homes, the financing for their assets, um, wealth management. Um, and so on. So I think if you can actually be very clear about um, the, the purpose and start to meet uh, those needs, um, then uh, I think we'll be uh, able to uh, serve our function well uh, to the very detail mm. of their needs. If I'm... Of course, no, that, and, and that will continue to be a challenge for uh, financial institutions as, as, as we go ahead, and particularly for Islamic finance. I'm mindful of the time, uh, Tansri, and, and we have a lot to cover. So I really want to talk about, you know, the impact of the aging population, right? And, you know, we heard some of the statistics and, and, and it's quite shocking to see that, you know, so many people can be so vulnerable 
in their old age, uh, you know, and, 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 and that can happen very, very quickly. What role do you think Islamic finance can play? Uh, in in addressing this uh, or, or sharia compliant investing can play because you know obviously this is going to be very very significantly impacting a lot of people going forward in society and perhaps doesn't get the same attention that other demographics get uh, but 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 you know it, it's it's approaching closer so i would love to hear your perspective on what can be done practically as you say you know fit for purpose pragmatically what can be done by the industry to address the challenge particularly when it comes to, you know, poverty in the old age? Well, Musawar, perhaps um, um, I can answer it in the sense that um, you do need uh, a system whereby um, as people uh, progress in their life, uh, there will be that opportunity for them to save uh, enough um, for the future. And um, within the context of uh, most uh, countries, you have the um, EPF or the CPF um, so which is the mandatory uh, pension contribution. Mm. And uh, for those uh, which are in the informal sector, uh, so that it's, it's important for uh, every country to actually have uh, the voluntary uh, contribution mechanism uh, to be put in place. Now, uh, within the context of uh, a Muslim society, for example, so having uh, a Sharia compliant uh, pension funds and investment uh, instruments would be uh, very, very important. Um, and by nature, uh, when you uh, invest in something in, which is Sharia compliant, um, so uh, it means that, that you must meet the objectives of uh, Makassid um, and every, it must be a true, purposeful. Uh, and the other would be, uh, as you invest in these entities, uh, it will generate uh, sustainable uh, returns. Now, uh, so that's within the context of um, you know savings um, and creating that pension funds uh, for the future from your own uh, income. Uh, for those less fortunate, uh, obviously we have uh, the uh, social financing mechanism, and within the context of Malaysia, obviously um, the, the, the zakah um, uh, arrangements is very, very important. Uh, that provides uh, that support for the underprivileged community. Um, uh, so perhaps uh, not many people, people realize that. And only uh, the total zakat contribution in Malaysia is about four uh, billion ringgit, um, and uh, almost half of that uh, actually uh, came or uh, is actually collected uh, by the states of um, Selangor uh, and wilayah um, Persekutuan. Uh, so these two, depending on the years, uh, between forty-six to forty-eight percent of the total uh, collection. Uh, the third um, state is uh, Johor, uh, and then followed by. Uh, Perlis. Uh, a lot of people have been asking how come Perlis is actually number four. Uh, but there'll be for another conversation. Uh, uh, but uh, I think the, the, uh, the, the challenge would be how do you make sure that the, the, the benefits will, will then be equitably, equitably distributed? Uh, because you find that um, the states that collect the highest amount of zakah will be the uh, better, uh, more economically developed states uh, compared to the other. Uh, see um, uh, East um, Coast states uh, like Kelantan, Terengganu uh, and, and Pahang mm. and Kedah for that matter. Um, so I think um, there will have to be some mechanism how you can actually channel it uh, to the right uh, asnafs and so on. But having said that, uh, I'm, I, I think we are heartened with the fact that uh, some of the states like uh, Selangor and Belaya, for example, they do provide um, you know, support and assistance to many asnafs uh, in the other parts uh, of uh, Malaysia too. Um, now, the last one is about uh, maybe Wakaf, uh, which is, um, you know, developing, I would say. Uh, traditionally, uh, Wakaf uh, is something related to land. And I think there have been uh, some recent data to suggest that uh, about 3,000 hectares of land have been uh, put under Wakaf, uh, worth um, you know, a lot of money. Uh, I'm told it's probably worth uh, a few billion ringgit. Now, uh, what we'd like to move forward to is actually uh, on, on two parts. One is actually whether we can uh, look at, um, uh, instead of developing the work of land, sorry, uh, preserving work of land per se, whether uh, some of the land can be substituted with another land in another location and, and result, resulting in you being able to develop that work of land for uh, greater returns, which can then be put into the uh, work of fund uh, and then to be invested and to be able to support 
um, other social needs. Uh, and the other one is, of course, the development of uh, cash walk off, uh, which is uh, very much uh, evolving, uh, I would say. Um, so these are some of the areas which I thought would be relevant. No, I think I, I, I completely agree with you, uh, Tansri. And uh, as you mentioned, related to the social finance, the, the zakat collected, the uh, wakaf that, 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 that is available, uh, you know, can provide significant inroads in addressing some of these social challenges. But as you mentioned, like there is the issue with Islamic finance of equitable distribution and access to finance, that same issue exists on the zakat and walk of space. And hopefully with the advent of emerging technologies, that is something that will continue to be addressed. Uh, time is, is, is running out on Sri, but you know, we, we covered a lot of very interesting issues related to this. And I really must ask you, uh, for you know, for in conclusion, that you know, from your perspective, you know, when we look at these mega trends emerging, right, and you look at the Malaysian uh, economy and the Malaysian society, how significant an impact do you think they will have? And are you optimistic? Are you concerned? Uh, what 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 is your outlook when it comes to the impact that these mega trends will have on the economy and society in Malaysia and the role that Islamic finance will? play in, in, in this transition? Well, thank you, Mustafa. Perhaps, um, you know, I would, always, I would always like to go back to purpose, right? So again, uh, within the context of Malaysia and any country for that matter, we always aspire uh, to be a country which is progressive, prosperous, uh, which is inclusive so that no one will be left behind and which is uh, sustainable. Um, so that applies to Malaysia and other countries too. And in that context, um, you know, the, the financial system that we have must exist to support um, that the, um, you know, uh, objective. Uh, and within the context of um, inclusivity and sustainability, and, and I think this is where Islamic finance will come in, because you know, by uh, nature, uh, Islamic finance is consistent with the elements of sustainability. Um, every single transaction must be real uh, it must be supported by real uh, akkad. It must not be harmful to the environment, uh, to, uh, to to life, um, and so on. And there must not be any elements of um, uncertainty or gara. Um, so no excessive speculation, um, and so on. So I think if we are to be pragmatic and uh, we truly embrace uh, the spirit and intention um, of Islamic finance, so uh, naturally. Um, Islamic finance will have a, a big role to play and, and, and that will include um, what we spoke about uh, in terms of uh, social uh, finance, uh, the concept of uh, wakaf uh, and zaka. Now, uh, on our part at Bursa Malaysia, um, we do what we can uh, to support the development of the Islamic capital market um, and uh, apart from uh, broadening what we're already doing uh, in respect of the Bursa Malaysia I platform, uh, our Bursa uh, Sul Asila. Um, we, we're also looking at them developing other products to help support um, uh, these objectives. Uh, number one, uh, we are facilitating um, the, the Hibah concept, uh, whereby we now allowing uh, people to, to, to Hibah uh, their um, CDS accounts uh, so that um, you know, investors can continue to trade uh, without um, fear of uh, having some issues uh, when it comes to uh, wh when they die uh, about their uh, estate issues and so on. Uh, so that's something that we, we are working on. Uh, secondly, um, we are also working uh, on uh, the development of Goldina, uh, which we think is actually very important uh, to allow uh, investors to have access to um, gold investments, uh, which is very much digital based, but can be exchanged for real gold. And uh, hopefully that can, uh, in the future, be another alternative um, for Islamic uh, financing uh, platform. Um, so some that we are, we are developing. And, and the third area which we are working on is in respect of the voluntary carbon market. Uh, and that would enable uh, you know, businesses uh, to offset their carbon footprint um, uh, in our uh, voluntary carbon market. So buying... Um, carbon credits on our platform, uh, which will be a, a Sharia compliant um, platform, uh, inshallah. So with that, um, you know, thank you for this opportunity, uh, Musafa. Um, so sorry that we don't have enough time for 
uh, Q&A from the public, but i um, happy to engage with the, some of the time. Thank you. No, no, I, I, we, we thoroughly appreciate time, time Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, tr truly fascinating discussion. And as you mentioned, you know, keep keeping in mind, being progressive, focusing on prosperity, inclusivity, and sustainability is the way forward. Thank you very much, uh, Tansri Abdul Wahid Omar, Chairman of Bursa Malaysia, for sharing your insights on the topic here today. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.